Yes, yeah, so I'm John Bretman. I work at a company called Badoo in London, and I'm not going to teach you about the future of the universe and everything. Um, I want to talk about JavaScript, and that probably doesn't come as much surprise because we're all here to talk about JavaScript. But I want to talk about JavaScript, just JavaScript, maybe not a lot of things we're talking about here, just for 30 minutes of your time. Um, I write a lot of JavaScript, not CoffeeScript, nothing like that, just JavaScript a lot of it, and have to contend with a lot of problems. I think a lot of people do, and we talk about these things a lot. We maybe bash JavaScript a little bit. But I wanted to talk about what we're doing in production now, today, with things we have, not maybe the things that are coming soon, although that's really cool. Um, there's four things I'd like to talk about, and I think these come up almost every day for me. And they may seem quite basic and quite low level, but still, I'll have a little chat. So. Type checking. JavaScript's dynamic, which is really good. We want a dynamic language. That's why we, probably why we love it. But sometimes we need to check for things. So sometimes we need to actually know that something is what it says it is, or what we think it is, before we act on it and fall over ourselves. What we don't want to happen is this. We've got a year to make sure this doesn't happen. And um, he's a funny guy. <laughs> um, what does he mean? What does he mean by literally wrote everything in JavaScript and nothing works? Well, I think we all know what this is. This is a web app. And it doesn't do anything unless we have JavaScript. So let's assume we do have JavaScript. We're not on something with disabled JavaScript. We have JavaScript. That file is going to load, and it's going to change the world for us. And we might do something like this, which is very reasonable. And you, you know, nothing inherently wrong with this. But there are some things that could go wrong with this. You know, there's a lot of things that could go wrong, but those things, we, we don't know what conversations is. We assume, in this case, it's an array or something that array-like. We don't know that. And actually, a whole lot of things have to go right for that not to break. This is common. We do this all the time. So if data value, so truthy, truthy's fine. We like truthy. But in this case, null. Again, which, you know, so truthy, data, Data.value, we're really kind of going down this road of saying, do we have what we want? But we don't. And interesting with this example, what's value? Is it a string? Is it an array? Is it something else that implements the same method? Who knows? We don't know. Again, similar example again, but you know, truthiness. We check for this thing of saying, oh, do we have something? Does it contain something? Yes. Is it what we think it is? No. So we use type of. You see that a lot. It's operating JavaScript built in, awesome. And it does what it should do for all these examples. That's really great. But it doesn't do what, it should, what you expect it to do for these things. And we, that's probably us all know this. Yeah? We all know this type of array object. Type of null object, oh, it's not helpful. Um, type of not a number, number. Not broken, but not useful. Not useful. So a lot of people know we can use this. You see this in JavaScript libraries all over the place. You see this in underscore, you see this in jQuery. We know we can use this to check for types. And why? Because there's a really good spec for it. It's a very specific spec that says, if this value is undefined, we should return this string object undefined. Same for null. It's awesome. It's really, really specific. And then it gets a bit more interesting. It says, let class be the value of the class property of this. So we're talking about internals of the JavaScript engines, which I'll be honest, I know nothing about. And then return this string where we have object, class, square bracket. Fantastic. And we kind of, probably a lot of you would have seen that string, this, this square bracket object thing. And we write something to use this because this is dynamic, because this is great. This is JavaScript and everything's dynamic. So we can use our caller apply function prototype to change the value and get to it. And we see this in, or versions of this, in kind of loads of JavaScript libraries. Again, kind of see this in underscore, similar-ish things in, in jQuery and other libraries. And the magic here is that we're, we're calling this method. We're calling it with a, with a context. I mean, a lot of you may have seen this and think, yeah, I know this. But this is not a lot of code. And I wonder how many people have got maybe underscore or something similar which again isn't a lot of code in the grand scheme of things, but you know, this is a lot of what we do. So checking, is this, is this something what we think it is? And this is like six lines of code. Really not a massive problem. 
to, you know, to write this yourself or have something that does something similar. So going back to what we had before, we have good, good results for all the things we started with we had good results for before, which is obviously what we'd want. But starting to get better, more useful things back for everything else. So now we're saying, right, array, null, date. But there's two on here that are still, still not really very useful. Um, remember we said about the class, the internal class property. So in this case, you know, the body is HTML body element, HTML span element, HTML anchor element. Almost too specific for most cases. You probably want to say, is it an element? But, you know, it's your app. You can do what you want. Um, and type of not a number, still number, still, you know, in this case, just check a type. That's not really useful. You know, we're going to have to go further. So we could go further. We can write something a bit more complicated, application specific. We can say, well, we want to check if the, we want not a number to be a type in our app because it happens a lot or we want to handle that case. We want, it, we want elements just be elements, and th that's just pulled straight of underscore, but you could do that a lot of different ways. The point here is we're making some special cases for these things, and we could make more special cases for the app you're writing that makes sense for the app you're writing. And I think that's fine. We go back to original example, rewritten, to make sure we don't have these errors. And if you're thinking, well, this is a lot more code, though, and you're, really, you're, you're right. It's, an extra 137% of code are minified. But again, you know, so you've, it depends how you look at it. I mean, yeah, it's more. But do you want something to break in production? You've got millions of users. Do you want Gary's prediction to be true? Probably not. But it's about being sensible. Check for types we're not doing so could cause an exception or make code ambiguous. You don't have to do it all of the time. But when we're talking about external data, things from APIs or whatever, Let's check it then. Let's just make sure that if we haven't been completely in control of what we're doing, that we're actually checking other libraries and things like that. So let's move on. Let's talk about classes and inheritance. Josh doesn't have classes. Again, know this. And why does it matter? Why do we want classes? It feels like we gravitate towards it as developers. I feel like we always end up coming back to this as a structure. And rightly so. We kind of want to do this. And maybe someone's like, no, I don't want to do this. But kind of we do. Everyone wants to write this. And the reason I say everyone wants to write this is because things like this exist. And this wouldn't exist if someone didn't want to write the previous slide. And this compiles to JavaScript. A more popular example, much more terse, but still you know, class, extends, super. We're going back to these same concepts all the time. And this exists because someone didn't want to write this. Which, again, I understand. You know, you've got a large code base. You're already in JavaScript world. And CoffeeScript comes along. And you look and you think, oh, it's really, really good. I really like that. But I'm already here. I'm already in this world. Well, we've got all this code. And I kind of don't want to go there. And you know, I also don't want to have to write this. But this is a, you know, half of this is a utility method, or 30% or so. We're not going to include that. That's only once. Okay? So we can, we can kind of throw that away. And that's our class definitions. So we can pull that. That's, that's compiler output. Yeah, so I would write this, or you know, or similar, and it's starting to look a bit nicer now, a bit more, more compact, a bit more like we want it to where we want to be, and this is just JavaScript. Okay, this isn't anything special. This is all stuff we all know. Um, the only magic bit is this. It's the only thing we've had to bring to the party, and yeah, like you know, so lots of cool things coming. We're going to have class extend you know, very soon, um, but right now we do things like this. And that does this. So what's this doing? Again, not a lot of code, really, for, you know, for, to say, oh, you know, JavaScript doesn't have classes, or it can't do classes, or we can't do this. We have to use something like CoffeeScript to be able to achieve this. Um, we have something like this in our code base that's you know, more or less exactly this, copying static properties and methods. And we'll come back to static stuff in a minute. And setting up the prototype chain. And this is like classic interview question JavaScript, isn't it? We probably all know this. And I just think it's interesting to point out that, it's, again, it's you know, six or so lines of code. So it's interesting when we come back to these things of saying, we can't do this in JavaScript, or it's, no, it's really awkward to do this in JavaScript. I just think I, I disagree. I think this is really not a problem. Although it's nice that these new things are coming. Right now, still, this is fine. And we end up where we want to be. We end up in the right place. That there's few extra lines of code, slightly different syntax. We've got here, and this all does what you would expect it to do. And from then on, it's about good practice. 
and how you're managing teams. Is so you're just you, and you're very lucky. It's you code review yourself, but we have a you know, small team of developers. We look at each other's code, and and from then on, it becomes about standards you set yourself. You don't have to use getters and setters, but it's quite good to. And I, I mentioned um, I saw a talk earlier when someone said about you know obviously we're, we're coming that into uh, defined properties and and kind of ES5 ES6 stuff where we can do getters and setters through the first example. We could actually have getters and setters for those, but if you don't. You know, something like the bottom example there's like kind of an ember, we have a simple set method that takes the key and the value and allows you to maybe bind some stuff or listen for those changes and stuff like that. This is just a kind of personal bugbear of mine, just because I'm on stage, I get to tell you my bugbears. And not defining things in classes just so irritating and just you know, just say what you're doing and describe it. Use it use it as an opportunity to put put a dot comment in there and you know, say what you're trying to do, and kind of randomly having this dot age, for example, you know, it just kills me. We, you know, obviously you can do things with closures in JavaScript relatively easily, but if you are writing, maybe you want to write some tests, maybe testing private methods is a bit taboo, but if we want to do things like this, then just mark it as such. You know, this is, this is fine. You, you know, this isn't, someone can still call that method. Yeah, that's not, we're not going to, convince ourselves otherwise, but you know, it's simple, but let's make it clear to other people and to ourselves, coming back to it, what we're trying to do. I mentioned static earlier. I mean, the first example isn't wrong, yeah? I mean, it's not wrong, but I just think it's, I think simply maybe if we forget we can do this, you know, this is just, uh, you know, with, the, with this extends method we saw previously, we're copying all this stuff along as we extend stuff. And this is just a nicer structure, I think, for things that exist across all instances, you know, standard OO stuff, but we don't, I don't see this in JavaScript very much. I don't see this in other libraries. I, I think, you know, this is really nice. So we've got classes, we've got type checking, we've kind of gone down this road. We've, I think these things are, are not really big problems for me. And, you know, again, we deal with this all the time. Um, asynchronous code everywhere. Everything in JavaScript is asynchronous, pretty much, especially in the web. We're, we, we live in this world of asynchronous. And we live in this world of, world of, kind of two choices. We say we have kind of callbacks or promises, and you kind of sit on one camp maybe, and you you know like one or the other more than more than the other. Promises, you need a library. Let's say it's not part of JavaScript. This isn't something you can just do. You know, open a file up and you've got it. You're going to have to include something. And there's some different implementations of these things. You've maybe got a decision, another you know another choice to make in the project of what you want to use. Um, and if you're thinking of doing it yourself, well, it's kind of complicated. I mean, this is just the then method. Like, this isn't easy. This isn't trivial. So you probably don't want to go about writing this yourself. So I suppose you're here, and we all know this. Everyone knows this. Um, there's no choice. You have to now enter callback hell. Um, I'll share with you something I found. I've come to the conclusion that callback hell is a design choice and not an inherent flaw in the concept of asynchronous function plus callback. Design choice means bad code, basically. <laughs> we don't have to go down this road. We don't have to. We can still use callbacks. We still have some relatively nice code. This was my callback hell from maybe like a year ago when I joined the company. I won't name and shame anybody. But it was something along these lines, you know, kind of like lots of things going down this chain, getting deeper and deeper, and kind of two separate callbacks, success, failure. There's a lot of this going on because we're creating all these anonymous functions. The action and error handling is miles apart, really hard to follow, really hard to work out what's going on. Node style for me is just this is you know this is this is this is great. This is really elegant and you know it's really simple. No, it's not complicated in any way. This and you kind of stick to a standard pattern of we've got a callback. Our first thing is going to be some kind of error or null if there's no error, and everything else is our is our is our response. And over, the, say, like a year, kind of, and some you know, general refactoring and moving towards this, that previous example kind of became something more like this, a simplified version, but this kind of thing. And we didn't have to include any additional libraries, didn't have to wait for some new features to be implemented, just, you know, just a change of structure. And I think we've left callback hell for me now. Um, we have name methods, and we have no binding. I also should mention that all of these methods are, are bound to the correct context. And the, you know, so instead of having one big method where we do everything, creating all these anonymous functions, we just set up our scene. We have all these methods ready to go, and it gives us this nicer structure. So to avoid callback hell, 
You often say, well, we'll avoid anonymous functions. Well, why? Why should we avoid anonymous functions? We get used to the stack traces, for one. And it's kind of a sign of poor structure, because an anonymous function generally is kind of just thrown away after you're done with it. It's kind of rare that we do something where we just throw away the, we do, we do something once. You know, so we make an API call. We probably do it quite a lot of times. So we might as well hold on to that function. Otherwise, we're just creating it over and over and over again every single time. And we keep things really shallow. But interestingly about this, if, you, if things aren't shallow, you're probably using anonymous functions because that's how you've got into this deep world, which means you've broken the first rule, which means everyone will hate you. So that's asynchronous code. So finally, all, tying together these things, I'll just like to talk about a bit about performance, really briefly, because it's a talk in itself. And how does all this stuff affect performance? How much do we need to worry about it in production? So we all, we, know, you can do, we do benchmarks and we see what's faster, what's not faster. But when you're actually working on something, and we're looking at, when you look at things like kind of UI performance and things like that, and, and profiling, you know, memory management. This often comes up first when we talk about kind of performance. We talk about things like this, and you know, I've been there, I've been down this road. I think a lot of people have been down this road. You think, you know. The top example is just so much better. It's going to be so much faster. And it is faster. We all know it's faster. Okay? Don't even need a benchmark to tell us that. It's going to be quicker. But is it going to be noticeably quicker? Is it going to make any real difference? And is it going to make things easier to read or harder to read? And I think at this point, you, it's where we have to make, we have to be sensible about things. And as I said at the beginning of the talk, write sensible code. So, yes, it's obviously faster. But is it going to make things better for us in the long run? Another example is something like this. And I think the top line is kind of fairly rookie jQuery. But you know, whatever. It's, the concept here is we're saying, I want to get every anchor in the world, and I want to bind click listeners to it. That could be a lot of anchors. And the second example, we're using some delegation. And these delegations you see in every MVC library. But it's really not very hard to do. And again, maybe I think you see this quite a lot. I think this is used a lot. Um, but huge memory management uh, benefit here. And finally, just. We go back to that original example of this kind of HTML file that has nothing in it. We're going to have to do things like this. We're probably going to use templates, so this is kind of a trivial example. But we're going to build up some HTML and we're going to put it in the DOM. And if we do it in the first example, we're kind of appending things and then searching for something and then appending something and then searching for again and then appending. And that messages might be like a hundred of messages we want to render, and it's going to just look awful on, let's say, mobile. I mean, I work specifically on mobile. Um, even you know, iPhone 5 and kind of you know. Android S4s and things like that. It's just, it's going to just look awful. It's going to go as it's trying to render all these things. And any animations you've got going on, any transitions, is going to fall flat on their face. Um, you know, and it, it's just a good, good pattern. What we're doing at the bottom, we do this everywhere in our code. Um, moving from this top example again, we saw a lot of that, and we're like, nah, no, it's bad. So when we talk about performance, I think actually we should be here first. We should be at DOM operations before this is good. We shouldn't even worry about everything else because, well, I'm talking, I'm talking web, okay? So, you know, it doesn't apply if you're purely server side stuff. But web, you know, this is where we should be. And we should make sure this is really good. When this is really good, I think then we kind of start here and we start saying event listeners and things like that. And how much stuff are we holding in memory? Then we start looking at that. Finally, if you've done all these things, you're lucky enough to go and look through all of your for each and map and filters and change them into for loops, then you're a very happy person. Another part of performance that I talk about a little bit is kind of things like this. And we had, we had something like this in our code, simplified version, but very, very similar, where we're just kind of wrapping local storage. We're probably doing a few other little bits and pieces, but ultimately just kind of getting and setting from local storage. Local storage is quite slow. It reads and writes a disk. And on mobile, it's really quite slow. And so we were seeing on, you know, again, if you have any animations, any transitions, anything like that, you know, you start seeing these real like, rah, 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 and you realise when, when you get down to the bottom bit that we're just saving something to local storage. You know, so how can we avoid these things easily? And there are some good libraries for storage, and that you know, kind of abstract away all these things and maybe give you the ability to use index DB and things like that. Um, but really, again, not that hard to just say, okay, well, you know, let's just optimise this a little bit. Let's have something for memory just to hold on to it. Let's uh, make reading quicker by holding on to things as we've got them. And let's save things for later so all of this works. This isn't really very hard. Again, like, like a lot of the previous I'm saying, I mean, these are kind of an extra six to eight lines of code. I think that's fine. And that's the end of my topics. 
So thank you very much.